Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Morgan. I'm the producing artistic director of the virtual York Theatre Company. And this is the 19th of the York Theatre Show and Tell series, which revisits notable York productions and brings the people who made them happen back together for a virtual re reunion. We've celebrated such shows as Enter Laughing, Desperate Measures, Closer Than Ever, Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope, Merrily We Roll Along, Tom Foolery, Taking a Chance on Love, Roadside, and Anyone Can Whistle, and more. You can find all of these on our YouTube channel. Subscribing to our YouTube channel costs nothing and does great things for both of us. You'll be able to access all of our events simply and easily, and it helps build our audience in today's essential world of social media. A little pandemic tried to interrupt the York's 50th anniversary, but this series is a great way to continue the celebration of our history. We're delighted to share these shows and the people who created them with you. Next, we will revisit Subways Are For Sleeping on December 28th as we celebrate Christmas. It'll be the first time we did back-to-back -back shows in this series by the same composer. If you can guess the composer, you win some sort of a prize. It's probably virtual, so don't worry about it. Various standalone events are happening throughout the fall, including our ongoing musical theater training program presentations. Nancy Ford and Mimi Turk's Blue Roses, a wonderful new musical adaptation of Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie, will be part of our 2021 programming. More on that later. We're in the middle of probably the true highlight of our fall season, other than tonight, Broadway's Great American Songbook, an online cabaret series hosted by Michael Feinstein, featuring weekly performances from some truly incredible performers. Kicking off the series were the amazing Alton Fitzgerald White, Leroy Reams, Karen Mason, George Abood, and most recently, Ben Vereen and Clea Blackhurst, all of whom wowed our audiences. And coming up this week, beginning on Wednesday at seven, is Cagney's Robert Creighton with special guest Richard Kind. Our co-producer is Ricky Kane Larimer and the director is Mac Award winner, Barry Kleinborg. Tickets are ever so reasonable and even bigger savings are possible for York members. So consider becoming one. Please join us beginning Wednesday, December 9th at seven o'clock for the next installment of Broadway's Great American Songbook with Robert Creighton. Please remember that your donations are essential in keeping our pandemic programming going. We want to keep these events free and to do that, we depend on your generosity. Also, don't forget that throughout the program, you can type questions or comments into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer them when we find the time. The show we are celebrating tonight, Bar Mitzvah Boy, was presented in our Musicals in Mupti series in 2018. This production marked the New York premiere of a new version first presented in London in 2016 with a book adapted by David Thompson and new songs with lyrics by Don Black and using previously unheard Julie Stein melodies. We have reunited members of the cast and creative team for tonight's discussion, along with two of the show's creators. I should mention this is, this is our first transatlantic show and tell, fingers crossed because one of our special guests is lyricist Don Black, zooming to us from London. Welcome, Don. From not as far away is another special guest, the adapter of the book, Mr. David Thompson. We also have the director of our production, a longtime friend of mine and the Yorks, Annette Joless, with another pal, music director, Darren Cohen. Our other special guest who is not a member of the cast uh, is Jason Buell, is, who is here representing the Stein estate. Welcome, Jason. And we have various cast members with us in no particular order. Tim Jerome, Lori Wilner, Ben Fankhauser, Ned Eisenberg, Neil Klein. Welcome to you all. And now let me turn it over to my cohort and co-host, Mr. Charles Wright, our resident theater historian, 
who is writing a book about the first 50 years of the York Theatre Company, and he also happens to be co-president of the Drama Desk. Charles, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Jim. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be transatlantic. Um, uh, this show, the show that we're celebrating tonight, Bar Mitzvah Boy, began as a teleplay on uh, BBC One, the plays, plays for Today series in 1976. And it was um, written by Jack Rosenthal, the late Jack Rosenthal. We're fortunate to have two people on our panel tonight who actually knew Jack Rosenthal. So I'd like to put, put a few questions to uh, Mr. Black and Mr. Thompson about the playwright and about the genesis of uh, the material. Um, gentlemen, could you just give us a, a few words, a, a character sketch of Jack Rosenthal? Well, he was one of our great, greatest uh, playwrights and a most wonderful, wonderful man. And um, every play he'd written for television was a landmark play. Uh, he did some wonderful work, but The Misfit Boy was my favorite. When I, as soon as I saw it, I thought there's so much to sing about. It's a musical. Well, it was embraced by the public um, and it won the um, 1977 British Academy Television Award as best single play. Um, and uh, it was repeated again and again on air in, in, um, in uh, uh, the UK. Um, it, in, um, in 1978, it became a musical and Mr. Black, that's when you came into the story. Can you tell us just a little bit about uh, that experience? Uh, we, we can go into it more later, but I, I do want to establish that it became material for Mr. Rosenthal's uh, farce, Smash, about four or five years later. From my point of view, one of my heroes was Julie Stein, always Julie Stein. I love from his, the things we did last summer to time after time. I mean, he wrote some of my favorite songs. So working with a legend and that word is much overused these days, but he was a true legend. And writing with him was quite a thing. Am I allowed to swear on this? <laughs> Am I allowed to say? No, I'm not. Sure. I'll ask you because Julie swore a lot. And um, he, he was a wonderful man. And he was so affable and lovely. And it, it was a honeymoon thing between Jack Rosenthal, Martin Sharnin. Uh, and myself and Jack, and we, um, it was going great. And everyone loved each other, particularly Jack and Julie. But one day we did a run through, and I'll never forget this. It didn't go too well. And Julie turned around to Jack Rosenthal and changed instantly and said, when are you gonna put some flesh on these fucking characters? And it changed everything. It was. Oh my God. And then we saw another side of Julie, who was always fascinating. But my God, he could turn very quickly. So we'll talk more about the, um, that, that experience later in the show. And by the way, you mentioned Martin Sharnin, the colorful Martin Sharnin, who was the American director of the musical. Um, uh, the, Tom, do, will you say a few words about the subsequent history of this material? Yeah, it was interesting because Michael Gennaro approached me. Michael Gennaro's father, Peter Gennaro, was the original choreographer. And Michael knew that this was one of his father's shows that he always felt it was the, one of his favorites that got away. And he said, can we go back and look at this screenplay, this musical that was in London, beautiful score, and try to make it work? And so uh, I said, yeah, let's, let's have at it. I, I knew the film, the original film, um, The Bar Mitzvah Boy. And, uh, and, and we quickly got to work. So Don and I worked very closely. It was like the kind of thing where we were gonna tip it over and start over to make it right. And it was, it, Don um, had such a clear idea of what it was, but what was also there was such a clear blueprint for what the story had to be. That was Jack's, of course, Jack's original um, screenplay. Uh, and 
the goal was to take it back down and, and, and push away all the trappings that had grown up around it, this, the, the bloating that happens when musicals get out of control and bring it back down to that very personal story of one family on one weekend, on one weekend of their life that was so important. And so we went at it and we had at it and we uh, had a chance to do a reading of it. It did play in London. And then when um, Jim asked to do it at the York, Annette came in and really helped us guide through that process, that final evolution of the script. And uh, the crazy thing was it was from the time, I think, Don, from the time you started in what, 1978 to the time we had it up on in showing in 2018, it was like a 40 year process of a, of a musical finding itself. But it was always there because Jack's work was always so perfectly written and observed that well, it, going back to it, it was there for us. Can I say something? Yeah. Of course. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to compliment you on your production, which I saw the other day. So thank you for sending it. And it was terrific. I knew what was wrong with Bar Mitzvah Boy. Um, and Tom did, and that's why he did this wonderful work. It was so overproduced and over orchestrated. It was glitzy and it had a sheen to it that I didn't want. I always wanted it to be an ordinary Jewish family. Yeah. That's all. Now, Martin Charnin, bless him, <laughs> who's a lovely guy, and very successful at the time with Annie. Um, and he made more of it. You know, he just put that Broadway spin on it, which it was nothing to do with a Broadway spin. You either buy it about, a, you know, a suburban Jewish family, or you leave it well alone. But your production and subsequent productions we've had in London, based on this one, um, it works a treat. So it's, 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 you used a good word there, Tom, about bloated. Yeah. They do get bloated because everyone wants to try and improve it where, where no improvements are necessary. Well, and that was the one thing about, uh, about the writing, Jack's writing, it was always about a very keen sense of observation. So it was always about these very small details, which you can't ignore and you have to celebrate. So it could be something like a mouse mask or a folding bike or a, or a haircut. A haircut is like an enormous event to this. But those little tiny details are telling of a larger emotional complexity of something that's happening. And that's what always made Jack's writing so so different and so special because it was about his ability to observe. And, um, and that was what was in this piece. And then of course, that was what sort of fell out when it, when it was uh, turned into a, the larger musical. And, and really that's what makes it a story now that's so, um, people can identify with because it's about those observed details that make something um, just very special and, and, and not typical in a musical. Well, I'm delighted the way it's turned out. I, I, I think, think, I, I think sorry, it will have ahead. a life based on your production. Um, yeah. And I, think I may, we should as well, have... may as well compliment your actors and director who did a wonderful job as well. I think we should also recognize that Julie Stein, that it may, people may not realize Julie Stein was British born. Um, and so uh, he, he was um, in some ways made perhaps the ideal composer, despite being associated with American culture. Uh, he was in many ways a, a, an ideal um, a composer for this material. Well, he, he lived in a place called Bethnal Green, which is about a mile from where I was born. And I took him there one day in London's East End. And I'll never forget that. I mean, to drive him to where he was born, it was such a moment for him. It was a landmark moment. And, uh, wow. and, uh, and on the way, of course, he was talking about all mm. the Sammy Khan and, and Gypsy and, and all his things he's done, you know. So it was the best journey I've ever had. Well, and the Green family of, um of uh, Bar Mitzvah Boy uh, have moved to Williston from Bethnal Green. So in their search for their, their upwardly mobile journey, they, they have left Bethnal Green and gone to Williston. That may be a good point, Jim, for me to turn this back over to you. And we'll get back to um, the, uh, the history of the show a little bit later. Okie dokie, thank you. Uh, but Don, I want to tie into something you said earlier about uh, uh, loving this 
very simple version. We find that we have found that repeatedly in the Mufti series, which are, for those of you who don't know, are bare bones concert presentations of shows that deserve a second look. And it really is as simple as that. Some were wildly successful and just aren't done anymore. Some were not wildly successful and deserve to try and be, the, the show in them needs to be found. We find so much, and this is a set designer speaking, that when you get rid of the gigantic production values that so many of these shows were saddled with and get to the material, if the material is good, it will work on a bare stage. And if you have a wonderful director, a music director and a cast to mine the material for all it's worth, um, we have found incredible gems in the series and this is one of them. So um, I, Remembered, I was trying to think today how we came to do this. We were doing a Julie Stein Mafti series. And I believe I was talking to Margaret Stein and uh, I was throwing out titles, he was throwing out titles. And then she began sort of pushing for Bar Mitzvah Boy to be the third show. And I said, I don't know it. And she said, you should, it's really good. It deserves to be done. And it was her pushing really that made it happen and come together and I'm so happy it did. Out of that, I called Annette, who is a wonderful longtime friend who's done wonderful work for us on a number of different productions. And um, she will talk about hearing this for the first time and blah, blah, blah. Sure. So um, this, my affiliation with this started as all of my adventures at the York do, which is Jim writes me an email that's something along the lines of, we have this show, it's being pulled out of a drawer. It's had a rocky road. Uh, you know, sometimes it's like, there's 47 people in it, you'll have $47 and 47 minutes, what do you think? Um, but because it's Jim in New York, and I know it's always going to be with the best of people, I always say yes. Um, and this one, though, he said, I want you to actually take a look at it, because I think you'll understand it in a different way. And I honestly, I read it, and I didn't even listen to the songs. I read it, and I was like, I'm in, before I even listened to it. Um, because this family, you know, Jim said, do, do you relate at all to this? I was like, relate, they're coming for dinner on Friday night. Like this was actually like stepping into the Friday nights of my childhood. Um, and there was something about the humanity of it. There, why I loved how the central character of this 13 year old boy just called out hypocrisy in his own family and in religion. And yet they all loved each other. Um, and there was just something in its heart that the songs, of course, then elevated as all wonderful musicals, you know, that, that happens in all wonderful musicals. But the, it was the story, the way these people spoke, they were so specific and so real. And um, so the show really centered around this family that was so incredible. And then when we added this cast to the show, this cast very quickly became a family. And as you know, in these Mufties, we're together basically for five days. But it was it was very sad parting when that week was up. Um, it really was truly a wonderful group of people that I think part of what made the show work was the spirit of just saying, we have this story to tell and we're doing it as a family. Um, and that extended to Darren at the piano, you know, all the, all the way through every little nuance that people brought into it. A clarification, though, Annette, you did several shows in the Mufti's on the old schedule. The old schedule was all within seven days. The new schedule, which this was actually a part of, is rehearsing for five days and previewing for three performances, opening on Sunday night, and then playing an extra week. So this did have the benefit of that new schedule where people can actually get to know each other and uh, begin to learn the lines, because it's an on-book process uh, by our insistence and, of course, equities also. But uh, on this new version with 11 actual performances, people can actually begin to get really comfortable with material. And that's what makes it even more joyful. And, Darren, and also, just really quickly, that we actually continued to make revisions as we were going. So oh. the fact that we were on book just you know let us cross things out you know really was tightening it wasn't that we were putting new songs in the, the oh, music yeah, set yeah. but in terms oh, of yeah. the, the book it was the first time it was being heard you know some of this so it let us just say no we don't need that monologue you know and 
and because all it involved is people crossing it mm -hmm. out, you know, in that we didn't make changes once the audience was there, but in those four and a half days, we were able to just take a pencil and say, you know what, that, that does its job. And I think having that process was, was really exciting, even though it was much shorter than it would be in a full production. Annette and Tommy, would uh, e would you or either of you just give us a thumbnail sketch of the story of the um, of Bar Mitzvah Boy? It would just in brief. It's the story of a young thirteen year old boy, obviously, who's about to have his bar mitzvah, and the night he is about to, on the Friday night before, he's very conflicted. He's concerned about making that commitment, that statement that he is a man, and going through with the service because so many things don't make sense to him and his family, his uh, life what he's supposed to be doing and how he's supposed to be thinking. And he has a very good relationship with his sister and his parents are squabbling and his grandfather is there and he's having a lot of trouble. The day of the bar mitzvah, of course, everything continues to get ratcheted up. The mother is so concerned about the, the event that, that follows the reception, her hair, her father, the father who's a taxi cab driver, is, is not really serving in the son's eyes as that role model of what it means to be a man. And the grandfather seems just as much uh, out to lunch. The sister has a boyfriend and he's not really modeling what this, the way that the young boy, Elliot, wants to see the world around him and how people interact with one another. We get to the service, he's very concerned about it. And at the moment he's supposed to be going up to do his part he actually bolts and he leaves and he runs away. And so it's that point where people have that, all of us can identify with that point where we can, we do we, what do we do when we're faced with the decision that we don't necessarily embrace? But this is a 13 year old boy doing it. And then we see what happens to the family afterwards. Of course he can recite his part. It's not because he can't, hasn't memorized it. It's not because he doesn't know it. It's just because um, he doesn't feel it's right. And we do see the family by the end coming together. He does return. And uh, as the rabbi who's been teaching him all along tells him I'm a, that, that you can in the eyes of God, if you can do your bit and you can do your part, you can become a man. You don't have to do it in the synagogue. And uh, it's a way of just getting the family to move past and move on and the young boy realizes that that's really that first lesson in life is to be able to accept people for who they are, to love them anyway, and to feel like um, there's always going to be things that don't make sense. But as you move through your life, it's a, it's a way of finding, uh, finding your way through getting <clears throat> answers to questions that you don't necessarily ever think you can get answers to. Roughly, that's it. And then we sing and then right. we dance and that's the story. Uh -huh. I said that was a terrific summary. Yes, beautifully well, done. <laughs> and spare of the moment too. That's that's amazing. Why don't we take a moment and look at a clip of the opening number, which sort of sets up the whole show that Tom was just talking about. That was uh, left to right at one point, uh, uh, Peyton Lusk, uh, Julie Benko, uh, Lori Wilner, and Ned Eisenberg. And why don't we jump in and talk to any of you. Lori, tell us who you played, also where you're talking to us from now, anything, any recent news in your life since we did the show, and uh, uh, maybe a favorite memory. Okay, so I'm Lori Wilner, I played the mother, um, I'm talking to you from Accord, New York, New York, where I have a cabin on a lake and it's been a good place to shelter in place. Um, the last four months or so has been a rehab for me because I, um, I was in a production of Cabaret last year in Arizona and um, my Herr Schultz 
uh, tore my rotator cuff in a very unfortunate moment. Uh, so I had shoulder surgery and I've been uh, doing my rehab up here. Um, but I, I do just want to say it was such a joyous experience, this little two week, two or three week uh, uh, experience we had. It was um, just a, a joyous experience. I loved the material. I just, that music filled me up so much. I loved uh, the working experience, my fellow actors, the director. It was just a really, um, just a terrific time. And as a little bonus, uh, being filled with Julie Stein music for several weeks, I wrote a, a song right after that experience, very much in a kind of Julie Stein, uh, Julie Stein-esque and uh, so that's now part of my club act. And uh, I'm very grateful for that sort of infusion of Julie Stein music. Uh, I had a great time. Thank you, thank you. You don't want to just sing a little of that song for us? No, I won't perform the song. <laughs> well, you know, that, that song, that sort of breakdown song that she has, it was one of those rare moments as a performer where, you know, the, the audience just responded. So it was gangbusters. You know, it was such a great uh, um, response. And uh, it, it took me a little by surprise because, you know, I didn't really know the material. I had never seen a production of it. And so, uh, yeah, that that song, pe people who came to see it said, oh, you should you should definitely audition with that song. It's incredible. What's, what song was that? Uh, the um, Rita's request. Yes, Rita's. Request. Oh, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so many gems in yeah. the course of the uh, show. It's yeah. it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, Darren Cohen, did you know it before we started work on this? Had you ever heard of it? I did. Um, it's just a hobby of mine to collect music of shows no one's heard of. I never thought I would actually open it up and sit and play it, um, but I did know of it and I was so thrilled when Annette asked me to do it. Seeing how it has changed over the years, uh, you knew it probably from the original recording, the original that's, production? That's correct. It was really nice to see how it evolved. And I think what was the most pleasing and surprising is, you know, when you think of Julie Stein, you think of these tour de force numbers, uh, you know, that bring down the house in every one of his shows, whether it's Diamonds or a Girl's Best Friend or Rose's Turn or Don't Wait in My Parade. And I love that mm. this didn't need to be that. It was a chamber musical, really, that just kept going in and out of the scenes with songs that fit the size of the cast. And we didn't, it didn't try to be something more than the seven of them on stage. And I really, I liked working on it that way. It was no Where's the Where's the Don't Rain in My Parade number? Eh, not this show. Ned Eisenberg, who did you play? And where are you talking to us from? And a memory or two? Oh, well, I'm talking to you from, I played the father, and I'm talking to you from Jackson Heights, New York. And I had a spectacular time on this show. It really was a delight. I don't, I, I generally do non-musical work. And when I do get to do a musical, it is, it is a joy. And to work with this team and get to do duets with them and harmonies. And the, the character was wonderful, too. It was great embodying this Cockney East End London cab driver and his problems with his kids and, and his wife. And uh, it was a very special time for me. Very special. I enjoyed it. Good. And had you, did you know it at all going into it? No, no. I'd never heard of this piece. I'd never known the, uh, known the songs. I knew the other Julie Stein pieces you've been talking about, but not this at all. So it was like finding this, this <clears throat> treasure, this, uh, you know, undiscovered for me. Could not agree more. Tim Jerome, who were you? Who are you? And where <laughs> are you? And a memory I of ask myself that question all the time. <laughs> Um, this was a long time ago for me. Uh, life, uh, life is so tumultuous in general and recently, specifically during the pandemic, so crazy. And not only that, but the political situation we're living under, it has rather shaken me. 
Uh, I have good memories of the uh, of this, but I was a secondary character. Came on just to do my little bits, and then uh, and then uh, you know kind of wander off and think about whatever was going on in my life. Um, I, I I love working at the York. I got to tell you, um, I've worked at the York on and off. Uh, I think before uh, Jim came on. Um, and, uh, and I think it's one of the great theater institutions in New York. I guess I have to say that because it's true. Um, I uh, am also involved I'm in, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What'd you say, Jim? Also, because I'm sitting here. You have to, you have <laughs> yeah, that's right. I got to say something nice about Jim. He's such a wonderful guy. <laughs> uh, and I'm in, also involved in mean, my other life is in uh, mm -hmm. service. Uh, I, I run a company for 35, over 35 years to evaluate and promote new undiscovered musicals. And, uh, and it's a very rewarding experience for me, um, develop, watching shows get into the development track because that's the only way people are gonna see them. And uh, um, that's pretty much what I've, what I've been doing. As a matter of fact, since theater, live theater has dried up, shall we say dried up? It will be humidified one of these days, re-humidified. But uh, during this period of time, I've been making radio musicals and uh, out of, out of uh, uh, demos and uh, that had good you know, promotional demos that creators have provided to my company. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to be doing for a while, I think, until we're over this thing and maybe even beyond because radio musicals seems to make a lot of sense to me now. Okay, uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Me, Let's go to Ben Fankhouse. She, she loves me, she loves me not. She quite likes me, she quite likes me not. <laughs> The heralds of this world have their feet planted firmly on the ground so that everyone can fly. The heralds of this world don't say much that's profound, but somehow they get by. So yes, I played at Harold, mm -hmm. uh, the boyfriend, um, a bit of a schlemiel, I guess you could say, a bit clumsy. And that's so funny that you played the clip, the moment on the bench where he just gets enough confidence to maybe do a, you know, a song and dance moment on a bench, but no, better play it safe. And <laughs> it's so funny, my roommate 
comments on that particular moment all the time of of all the shows he's seen me do but uh yeah i'm coming to you live from harlem new york and uh i echo everything everyone said this was such a lovely experience i looking at the grid right now i have memories of shooting the breeze with darren in the green room and hanging out with ned and uh tim in the dressing room and and neil of course and and laurie in the audience and that's that's the great thing about the York is the bonding experience. You know, you're all thrown in this sort of, um, you know, canon basically. And um, I'm I'm impressed with myself for learning that whole song and not being on book because we, you know, it's it's funny as an actor you 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 want to have that material digested before you get in front of people, but you're not really offered the time, but it's, it's, it's really a thrill. And that's, of course, why I keep coming back to the, to the York, uh, because they do such great work and because it's such a fulfilling experience as an actor. But um, I, I just love this show as a bar mitzvah boy myself. I really related to the coming of age and um, especially in the, in the framework of, of a Jewish family and um, sort of you know, questioning things and um, looking at your role models and going like, who, who am I supposed to be like? And um, seeing flaws in your family and dealing with that. And Harold was a really fun character to play. You know, he's a bit of a, he's slightly needy. And we see that with his, with his girlfriend. He's a bit of a pushover. And I, I think, um, you know, the, the boy sees that and, you know, and um <clears throat> I, I, I just yeah, I I had great memories. Oh yeah, of course with Julie Benko and and everyone. It was it was really wonderful. I can't say enough great things about it. Thank you. That's great. Julie um had a scheduling issue. She can't be with with us today, but she sent in a recording. And uh Peyton Lusk also so much wanted to be here, but he will also send in something to share with our audience on Monday night. Hi, uh, my name is Julie Benko and I played Leslie Green in Bar Mitzvah Boy and I am so bummed that I am not at this event live with you guys. I am actually in school right now. I'm getting my master's degree in acting um, at NYU Tisch School of the Arts and I, at the time that you'll be watching this, will be in clown class live in person, if you can believe it. Um, but yeah, I will be like bopping around the room with a red nose on, which is why I can't be with you, um, which I really wish I could because I had such a lovely experience. Everyone was so kind and so warm and I loved the team and the whole cast. And um, I, I had a great time uh, working on this show, especially because my, my real life uh, uncle is a rabbi and he came to the show. And I think there was like a talk back right afterwards and um, he talked about how dramaturgically the show is correct. Like you don't have to get up on a podium to become a bar mitzvah, you just, uh, it just happens to you. So um, yeah, it was cool to share that with my family. And I also really loved getting the chance to reconnect with Lori Wilner. Um, she and I had both understudied mother and daughter in Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway, but we had never gotten to do it live in performance. So we got to do that in Bar Mitzvah Boy. And um, I really uh, wish I could be there. And I I, uh, I hope to be back at the York again soon, like sitting around that, that table in the green room, having a cup of coffee and being around actors and, and music directors and directors and just people again making the theater. So hope you're all well. Bye. Hi, I'm Peyton and I played Elliot Green. I think that the show was such a moving and incredible experience for me. And I think that it was this chance to show off this amazing gem. And I think that the production was really remarkable. I mean, Annette's direction and Darren and Ben and Neil and Lori and this chemistry between the cast and I feel this close kinship today between the musical and the production crew and, and the cast. And I, I just, I have so many fond memories in my heart. And one of them is after our dress rehearsal, talking to Jim Morgan and we were all together. And the show evoked this emotional response from him, which really makes me think about this incredible thing that we had on our hands, um, this incredible show. 
And it really was incredible. It was an incredible show and it was an, an incredible experience for me too. And it's something that I'll always hold close to my heart. Thank you, Peyton and Julie, for joining us, even virtually. You're so much a part of the Bar for Boy family that it would be uncomfortable to do it without you. Our entire wonderful cast, incidentally, was put together by a casting director, Jeff Josselson, who has cast more Mufti productions than I believe anyone and is a wonderful member of our team. And now to another cast member, Neil Benari, also known as Neil Klein. First of all, Lori, Tim, <laughs> Eddie, Ben, it's so great, and Darren and Annette, oh, the gang, it's, it's just great. You know, Lori and Tim and I, we go way back, and Ned was, uh, I was so glad to meet him. I've seen him in films for years, and he's always been just fantastic as a, as a that kind of actor. And I have to say, I marveled. He said that he, he doesn't do many musicals, and he had, he and Lori, had some very difficult harmonies and he aced it. Oh. And I, I was impressed that, it, you know, in the short time that we have, and Darren's a great musical director and Annette, she and I were constantly going and making sure that it was very, the Jewish stuff was exactly right because we were going to be judged. I'm coming to you from Larchmont, uh, New York. Uh, and I wish I was where Lori is because I remember when she first got that cabin <laughs> and, and uh, hardly had a road or the, you know, and, and so forth. And now she, she obviously has a beautiful home there. Um, I just, you know, as, as everybody said, uh, you know, York theater, I always wanted to, to, to be a part of that family. Uh, there were two, two theaters in New York. I finally made it to the York. The other one, only a few of us will remember is ELT. Oh, Equity yes. Equity Library Theater. I never made it there, but I was so glad to finally make it to the York. Um, and uh, as far as what I've been doing, you know, Bar Mitzvah Boy was the first show. I was in Taiwan for seven years as a teacher. And so Bar Mitzvah Boy was my first show back in New York. So I have, it holds a very special, I thank you all for, you know, Ned especially for hiring me to do the show. Um, and uh, I played the rabbi and, uh, it's always great to play rabbis, especially in, in, in this particular show, because um, it's, it's so full of soul. I'm a Jew and, and, and it's so soulful, like Hamakom. I just loved saying, doing it every night because it's just so heartfelt. Um, and I just, you know, as everyone said, we love being part of the experience. It was, uh, you know, came and went so quickly um, uh, but anyway, that's, that's my piece, Jim. And thank, thank you for having me there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to the next time as, as with everyone, Jason representing the, uh, Julie Stein estate. Uh, I'm sure you knew this going into it because you were very helpful helping us put it together. Talk about, but this is the, I'm sure the first time you saw it on stage or did you see it in London? No, <laughs> um, the uh, I, mean, I mean the 2016. No, I, I thought you meant the original first. Um, uh, no, I, it was it was really fascinating because you know as the archivist here in the office, I spend my days, you know, trying to piece together some of these these shows that aren't as documented as well. And Bar Mitzvah Boy was certainly a very elusive one because there's not a lot of material out there um, about the original productions. Um, we have the recording obviously, but there's not a lot of photos. There's not a lot of um, tangible stuff. So I have a lot of music here in the office that are manuscripts and pieces that have obviously gone through several different incarnations. Like um, I noticed, I was watching the video of the show yesterday and the song, the That's Grown Up that she sings, you know, we have copies of it where it started as a song uh, for Leslie, or not Leslie, um, Denise, the best friend. And clearly you see how she was a much, they, at one point she was a more prominent character or they considered developing her into a more prominent character. So it's just interesting to see all these bits and pieces and how, they, how they've come together. And then to finally see a production where you, you really see all the pieces fit. And it was really 
really wonderful. And it was, it's such a warm show and it, you know, it's so different from the rest of Julie's uh, collection. So really fascinating. Thank you. I know of at least one production that happened because of our production. Um, I believe it was in St. Louis, but uh, were there others? Has there been a resurgence of interest in the show since we did it? Uh, no, I wish there were, but you know, we don't have it. We don't really have it um, available to put out in the public. I'm sure if somebody called and requested, we could put it together, certainly from all the uh, it's not available. No. from your production. Um, but I'm not even sure if we have a final production that includes the changes that you made. The, I think the most current p thing I have are the, the PCs from the London production. So we'd probably have to have a nice lunch and afternoon work session just to make sure all the final pieces were put together. But that would, I don't think it'd be too complicated. Yeah. I have it might be worth it. Um, I would think it'd be worth it. Um, I, know Mar I know Margaret would love to get it licensed. So, you know. I think it's just a matter of putting all the pieces together, so to speak. And then we could do a full production at the York. Oh, in two weeks. that'd be great. <laughs> yes, uh, get the cast back together. Charles, let me turn it back over to you to explore uh, some history with Don and Tom. And, and that, anyone feel free to jump in when you hear something that speaks to you. Um, um, but I'd love to hear more about the original production and um, uh, Jack's book about the writing of the musical or the experience of the musical. Oh, Charles? Yes, farce, yes. Well, yes. first, I'd just like to say, Jason, I'm surprised to hear uh, that you don't have more material about the uh, the London production because it it wasn't really a flash in the pan. It ran 77 performances. Um, uh, Don Black, um, could you just give us a little uh, more about the, uh, the, the, the West End production? Uh, it, it was uh, Martin Charnin directing and uh, Peter, Peter Gennaro uh, choreographing, right? Yeah, I mean, we thought it was wonderful. The way, and the audience loved it, but my memory of Bermitzvah Boy, I remember it's a long time ago, it's really all about Julie Stein because he was such an amazing character. And um, we obviously someone once said uh, musicals are written to be rewritten. So there's a tremendous amount of rewrites went on with that character changing from that. I did lyrics so many times to the same tune. But if you ask me to think of one memory, it doesn't concern anyone apart from me and Julie. Every time he played me a tune, he would say to me beforehand, this is probably the best thing I've ever written. <laughs> and that, that's before every single tune was the best he'd ever <laughs> done. So it's very hard to be diplomatic. It's very hard to say to him, I'm not sure about the bridge, Julie. You think you take your life in your hands. So you have to be very diplomatic. But um, Martin Charnin, who just came off the biggest hit with Annie, and Julie Stein, the legend, and Jack Rosenthal, who was not into musicals at all. He was the odd man out, really. And you know what show business people are like. He used to say to me, when I look at you, Don, when I look at Martin, when I look at Julie, you get so excited and I can't figure out what you're so excited about. <laughs> you know, he had nothing to do with musicals. And, uh, but it, it, the show was good, but it was overdone. It's as simple as that. It had to be about ordinary people. And mm -hmm. Martin Charnin, and I'm not knocking Martin because he was a brilliant guy. But in American musicals, I'm, this is going to be a terrible thing to say to you wonderful people. <laughs> There's a lot of songs in musicals that say, look out world, I'm coming through. <laughs> or, you know, I've got to be me. And, <laughs> and the orchestrations, and they seem to say that, where all we're saying is the heralds of this world, that's what we're like. Hey, what am I going to do about the seating plan? There was no, uh, there was no reason to, for many key changes. <laughs> um, so that's what was wrong with it. I have to say, although this sounds conceited, and I don't mean it to sound this way, but when 
the reviews came out and they weren't great. And what they said was it was a bit overblown, but it changed my life in a way because when the bad reviews came out the same day, I got two cables and they were cables that were amazing. One was from Michael Bennett and I've got them hanging up in all. One said, the best lyrics I've heard on a West End stage, Michael Bennett. The other one was from Hal Prince, who said, impeccable work, bravo, Hal Prince. A day or two later, I got a call from Andrew Lloyd Webber, who heard it from Hal Prince. And that's how I started working with Andrew. But this isn't about me. But as a result of the Mitzvah Boy, it put me wow. in, in touch with those kind of people. The show was 1978. And I believe you were out of town in Manchester, right? Yes. Uh, did, uh, how much did it change in the course of uh, uh, the, the pre-West End? Uh, well, it, uh, it, changed on a, it changed on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. That's what musicals are, you know. Um, I always love the, uh, the definition that the great humorist Oscar Levant said about musicals. He said, a musical is a series of catastrophes followed by a party. <laughs> and that's, pretty much, that's pretty much it. Well, and that might be a good description of uh, the play Smash that Jack Rosenthal wrote in response to the experience of, of um, Bar Mitzvah Boy. Yes, that, that was, I, I thought it was very funny. Someone played me, someone played Julie. Uh, it was a bit kind of uh, inside showbiz type stuff. But for those people who like that kind of thing, it was a terrific piece of work. Actually, we should send it to you. Well, it wasn't a musical, but you should read it just for the hell of it. Well, maybe it should be a musical. Life's yeah, too short, uh, James. I know people who can turn it into that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a minute, and then we'll come back to you, Charles. Let's take a minute and look at some photographs from our uh, Mufti production. Is it so wrong to expect your son to show respect. He's always asking questions, but nothing sinks in. All these wonderful photographs are by Ben Strothman. Um, they really capture wonderful moments in this show. What's a win? Why can't he be like me? Why can't he be like me? Our creative consultant, Hans Friedrichs, put these together and labeled them, and uh, we are grateful. Yeah, look at that. Oh, that's, that's a great photo. Beautifully staged for that. We have another song to share with you really quickly, then we'll get back to some discussion. I have never asked a thing from you, my family. <laughs> but there's only one way out that I can see. If you've any heart at all, my darling family, <laughs> kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna be a very famous family. <laughs> Fresh fruit of your own choice. <laughs> 100 
17 people from the five corners of the world. Four corners. Call me a liar for a corner. <laughs> Arriving at the dinner dance and no one bids for boy. No one bids for no boy. No, nothing. Everybody heading to the Roman showman hall. When they get there, they will talk about us all. I can't think of an excuse. Will one of you go buy a noose? A noose will not make such a mess. Please kill me. Bravo. <laughs> Lori, does that bring back terror or? <laughs> Well, thank goodness we were allowed to have those scripts with us just in case we needed them, you know? Yes. But uh, yeah, that was a blast, that song. And I, I just loved, you know, working with Darren on it and exploring it. And it was just a, a lot of fun. So let's uh, talk a bit about the subsequent incarnation of uh, the musical. Um, the Tommy, 2016. 2016. Tommy, you come into the story here. Um, and in fact, it uh, the the genesis was on um, in in the UK, right? It was uh, done in Highgate at um, a pub theater. That's right. We it, we had actually done most of our work for a reading that we did in the United States uh, with with Michael Gennaro, but the but the piece hadn't actually been put up in front of an audience until we got to uh, Stuart Nichols' production in at Highgate, and um, it was great to have it come forward again. It was great to get it out of the box and, and to be able to look at it. It's one of those pieces, Don and I will, would always share emails back and forth about, you know, getting the boy back on the, on the boards. Um, and uh, it was, it, it's one of those pieces where it's, it, it seems to be finding and has always found its own path. You know, it's found its own way forward. And, and it was nice that it was actually able to be uh, presented again. So, um, so that was that production. It, it was, it was a, again, it was a very small vest pocket production, all working with the same ideas of always keeping the focus on the family and the story. Um, I failed to mention it was done in New York um, in the 80s at the American Jewish Theater. And yeah, that was a different version. It, 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 I think there's always, people will oftentimes pick up projects in order to get them to see if they can look at it, uh, that, that whole comment on, um, they just keep getting rewritten. I think what what made this one special was um, not only getting a chance to have at back, actually get back at the script, but Don and I actually spent a lot of time looking at music from the from the Stein estate. We were in the office, the Stein office, the, and uh, Jason would take us through, and we would open boxes of songs and and look at them. And <clears throat> sometimes they you would see because um, we were trying to. Fun. The thing when you'd rewrite a musical or rework a musical, you're given uh, situations, you write to scenes that all of a sudden are, is, you're missing a song and you have, to, you have to find that moment in music. So we were looking at a lot of uh, Stein music uh, and um, it was funny, Don will remember this, sometimes you'd find a song and it would be, there would be a piece of white tape over the lyric from another production and then another piece of white tape and then all of a sudden you'd see the the lyric cut out completely um with a an exacto knife but you always he was always holding on to the to the music itself so we would we went through boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff there were songs that were you know there were, literally there would be uh chinese delivery menus tucked into some of these boxes where all of a sudden you you'd pull out uh a piece of sheet music and you realized you were always looking at a source of material that was really quite uh, astonishing because you know you're looking at a the, the manuscripts of a Stein score and then Don in a couple instances would start from scratch and re rework a song completely based on a completely new uh, melody for a completely new moment but that was the difference and I think if you ever are in that process of rebuilding or reworking a musical you have to rebuild the score too because if you don't you end up uh you don't end up where you want you've got to have the music always matching the action and and it was great having that opportunity working with don uh you know don would jump in and say let's redo this let's rework that i have new ideas for lyrics and uh that made the process very special i think we were a couple of song detectives uh, that's what we ended up a bit of that, a bit of that. Can we use that bridge from that one? But it was fun, but it was um, a bit arduous, that's the word. 
Well, because you never knew. Of course, you're just looking at a hand. Sometimes you're just looking at a pencil sketch of a of a song, and uh, and you knew you didn't know what the song was. You had no reason to know. But the interesting thing about a Stein song is that he writes in a very long form. Typically, it's that eight bars, and then the bridge, and then the other eight. And his form is always very long. And sometimes it will take a curve before you come back in and before you come back around. So it's not a typical format. I mean, he did write his typical format melodies, but it's something um, that uh, Jason could probably talk about better. But his form was always what makes his songs remarkable because they had, uh, there's always an element of surprise in where the music is taking you. And so it was, it was fun to look at stuff, but, it, but as Don said, it was always a little bit of sleuthing because you, you know, you had to make sure that it matched the energy. It had to always sound like a 13 year old boy singing, not a, a woman singing at the end of an act, you know, you, which is a real distinction, you know, and it's finding a language for a character where it doesn't sound like you've left uh, this small family and all of a sudden, it's, you know, you're in the world of a, of a Broadway finale. So, um, well, it, now, was, it was fun. Are there any songs? in our production that had never been heard before, that were new for that production? Uh, yeah. Or were there, just, were there just tweaks to things that had been done before? One of the things that we worked on quite a lot with Annette, and Annette, you should talk about this. One of the challenges in the storytelling is that there's a moment where in the way the musical was written initially, when Elliot leaves the bar mitzvah itself, it was a big cacophony of catastrophe. And the same thing going into that scene where of course you're walking into a, a giant uh, synagogue filled with people all talking about one another. And Annette was very careful in helping us find what that, how to bring that piece of the story to life with as few players as possible. And it was, it was something I have to really credit Annette to helping crack because that was one of the hardest things that I found writing. And I know that we had talked about this a lot. Donna, I talked about this a lot, how you dramatize something that has to feel like it's an entire congregation, but you're really only given, uh, you know, your seven characters to deliver it. I mean, and talk about that because you were really helpful in, in helping us um, sure. navigate through that. I mean, I had the advantage of when I received the show there's some there's almost a gift in it not being so well known that none of the actors had preconceptions about oh but in the original like it didn't have that energy so it just was always to me a chamber musical it made perfect sense in this form and i think where where that moment was tricky as you mentioned because um it was the one place where it seemed to call for a larger production number and even in working it amongst you know this amazing group anything we did that smelled of showbiz instantly didn't work. Like when Darren and I would play through it, the minute, the minute we'd get to something, we'd be like, no, we don't believe it if we do it that way. Because this is not a family that can suddenly be doing a kick line. Like yeah. we've been too invested in them as people. So we really looked at how do we strip it back, keep everybody in character and get it to the essential of, it's still all about their nervousness. It's still all about um, this is the biggest day in their lives to this point. So it was kind of a, how do you strip away to that? And I, I seem to remember, and it's been a couple, couple of years uh, since first looking at it, but um, there was a lot of work that we did in the bar mitzvah scene itself. In how do you condense this service that in real life would have been, you know, three hours potentially. How do you condense it down? Because this is the central event of the show but obviously it's not the show, but you have to get through it. And I think we worked really hard to come in and out of the moments. So, you know, not to get too liturgical or technical, but how do you start an aliyah with one person and finish it with another without actually having the Torah reading in between that would have been there, right? So that you do it in a theatrical way. And I think that's a lot of the work that I, that I seem to recall that we did was kind of condensing that and hitting on key moments, but always keeping it about Elliot at the center of it. Yeah, that was, and it was, and it was, it, it actually unlocked it because it, it helped raise the tension of the story between the boy about ready to walk out and also the horror of the family. So it's little things like that, though, that I have to say, you know, when you can, 
not little things, it's big things like that, that you have to crack. And this process at the York with the net, with this cast was very helpful in helping finish the piece that way. Don, you, you had never seen the uh, video until the other day of this production. Uh, and it, it spoke to you? No, I hated it. <laughs> okay. No I, no, I thought it was terrific. It's what I always wanted it to be. This, the Mitzvah Boy is about ordinary people. I kept using the word ordinary because that, you know, when you do a musical, there's obviously a tendency to lift everything up and put a, a shine on it. But what I liked about what I saw the other day is that you're hanging on every word and every lyric. You're hanging on everything and you can hear everything. And it's focused. And so I was really very, very impressed. And that's very true to the original work. Um, the, um, the, the drama in 76, or 77 rather, was um, uh, slightly innovative in that um, it was shot on location um, and it was uh, relied on close-ups, which uh, were not um, common in, in uh, British television drama at the time. So there, if you see it now, you're struck by what a sense of intimacy uh, the director and the camera uh, people uh, achieved. Did Julie send you music and you had to set lyrics or was it reverse? Uh, he just played tunes and I put them on my cassette. And, um, and you know, he had this terrible habit of when I gave him the lyric, he would say, yeah, that fits. <laughs> But we, it was all very, I mean, I got on very, we ended up great friends. Oh, nice. You know, he, he took me, he loved gambling and uh, he took me to the races and he took me here and there. I, I became a great friend with him and Margaret and um, we had a, a lot of fun. It was great fun to write with him. Nice. Um, but he, he, like so many people, had so many projects going on at the same time. So, um, you know, a lot of the time he was talking to other people about other projects. But to write with the man was terrific because he, he welled up when he played a heartfelt melody. When you hear the Heralds of This World or We've Done All Right, to see Julie do it was just unbelievable. And he used to come to my flat in London. And after he would played me what he's just written, I would say, Julie, let's forget about this for the minute. Let's have an hour to forget about the mitzvah boy with this day and night. Play me some of your tunes. And then he'd go to the piano and he'd play It's Magic or oh. Three Coins in a Fountain. And we would have a lovely evening. So I have great memories of the, the whole experience. That's amazing. You didn't put those um, experiences on your cassette tape too, did you? <laughs> no, it's, uh, playing at your I'll, I'll dig them out. I'll dig them out. They may may end up at Christie's. Oh, good. That's great. That's great. Uh, we have one more song to share with everyone, and here it is. Do you tell me honest? Some days I could wring your neck. Excruciating things that make me want to pull my hair out, grind my teeth and cut a vein and climb a wall. But on other days, you're not bad at all. You could start to do things wrong.
to wend our way homeward, um, Don particularly. Uh, I have a question for everyone. Uh, looking at this show today for today's audiences, is there any reason to think it wouldn't play to a very wide audience if it's done well and simply and all the uh, things that have been learned about it over the years are incorporated properly with the perfect cast as we had and the perfect director and music director, all of that. Uh, today's audiences and this show is the question. Do you, it's a universal story. You know, it's that story that will never go, get old if it's told right. You know, that idea of learning how to accept things in life and then holding on to what's important and then learning how to deal with things that you don't understand. Uh, to me, it's like, it, it's a story that will always live for that very reason. And we, we tell it and we retell it in many different forms, but this one is particularly touching because it's about a family and that family was filled with characters that we all, um, we get to meet and love and understand the new ways. So yes, the answer is yes. And it's equally as touching as it is funny and has all the right elements. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to capture here without seeing, but the book scenes in this are so rich and yes. they really go at each other. I mean, they challenge each other and they confront each other. And, you know, in, in, a, in a discussion like this, we see clips of the songs because it's what gives us a sense of, of that and the beauty of the music and the show. But this, these book scenes are substantial. Like they were actually hard to just excise, you know, in, in these 30 second sound clips. Um, and they are as thrilling as the songs, Thanks. truly. Like working those book scenes is fantastic. And I think it's interesting because Don remarked on the ordinariness of these characters and Ben talked about how Harold, you know, is just kind of like this schlemiely nice guy. But what's great about these characters that I think is so speaks to the universal is they are all wrong and they are all right. <laughs> and every single one of them has flaws because we all have flaws and mm -hmm. every single one of them also has redeeming qualities and we see what drives them and, and why they hold on to things or why they are neurotic or whatever their own individual you know quirks are and I, I think that that is that speaks to any audience of any of any generation. I would yeah. agree with that. And also I'd like to add that when something is done so well with such honesty and craft, uh, even though it's about one particular ethnicity, it is claimed by everyone. You know, pe people tell, you know, the Japanese people talk about how Fiddler on the Roof was their story and the Korean, you know, everyone, if it's done with that kind of authenticity, in specificity, it's absolutely relatable to all different kinds of people. And the other thing I wanted to say is, I loved the, the fact that we're watching all these individuals find a way to be individuals within these larger structures that they're trying to understand. And I think that's done so beautifully in the show. Uh, I'd just like to say, watching it so recently, I think it is universal and it stands up a, a memory came back to me just now talking about it. And I think it's one of the greatest end of act ones <laughs> in musical history. I remember in the, in the West End production, when that kid runs out of the synagogue, I mean, it is a gasp that you get from an audience. And they think, oh my God, the curtain comes down and everyone's talking to each other. And <laughs> what, what, what could, oh my God, that poor woman, what's gonna happen to her? It's a marvelous uh, cliffhanger. Um, there's lots of other attributes, but that one in particular is wonderful. Thank you all for being a part of this very special event, uh, making time in your schedule. A warm virtual hug of gratitude to all. Thanks to especially to our special guests, without whom none of us would be here, would have any reason to be here. Thank you, Charles, and thanks to so much to all for joining us. In just a minute, a final video clip which will put a smile on your face just as it did our Mufti audiences in 2018. I'd like to express appreciation to the entire York Theatre Company staff who all in one way or another made this event happen. And pushing buttons behind the scenes and admirably pulling the cast together, our creative consultant Hans Friedrichs, 
And another essential cog in bringing these conversations to you is our artistic associate, Fiona Sweeney, at the controls as we speak, navigating the Zoom scape. A special thanks to Nicholas Garrity for his magnificent editing. If you enjoyed this, please consider making a tax deductible contribution to the York Theatre Company to help keep these programs happening. Please click the link in the chat feature to donate. We all hope you did enjoyed tonight's presentation and now one final musical moment. The perfect man does not exist. Well, there are three, but it is not a lengthy list. That was a joke. <laughs> Thank you.